third ambiguity. On the double meaning of the words lend, loan, borrow, or the distinction between mutum and commodatum, number three. The third ambiguity has been the cause of most of the confusion in modern times on the subject of credit. When persons hear for the first time such an expression as credit is capital, they are apt to be startled, and they think that such a doctrine is as much as to say that if one person leads one if one person lends another his book or his watch or his horse, that makes two books or two watches or two horses. The whole difficulty arises from a want of knowledge of mercantile law and from not being aware that most unfortunately, the English words lend, loan and borrow are ambiguous and are used to denote two different operations of an essentially distinct nature. It has been shown that there are two kinds of right, the right of property and the right of possession. And there are two distinct kinds of loan, the one in which the one in which the right of possession only is given for a limited time to the possessor. But the right of property remains in the lender. And the identical thing lent is returned to the lender. In other, the, the other in which the borrower acquires the actual right of property in the thing lent and the lender acquires in the exchange for it, the mere right to demand an equivalent only for the thing lent, both in quantity and quality, but not the identical thing lent. Number one, the commodatum. There are some things which can be lent and the borrower can enjoy their use without acquiring the absolute property in them. And after having so enjoyed their use, he can restore the identical things lent to their owner. Thus, if a person lends his horse or a book or his watch or his carriage to his friend, his friend can ride the horse or read the book or use the watch or the carriage without acquiring the property in them. And after he has enjoyed their use, he can restore the identical horse or book or watch or carriage to the owner. In such a case, the lender only grants a certain limited right of possession to the borrower, but he does not cede the right of property in them to the borrower. He retains in himself the right of property and possession in the things lent, and he can reclaim them at any time he pleases, without any notice to the borrower. In such cases, there is no sale or exchange, and no new property is created. In such cases, the relation of creditor and debtor does not arise between the parties. And there being no sale or exchange, there is no economic phenomenon. And consequently, such, exchange, such transactions do not enter into the science of economics. Such a loan is termed in Roman law a comedatum. And in Greek law, Some Greek word. Okay. Because the use only of the loan is granted to the borrower and not the property in it. Number two, the mutum. But there is another kind of loan in which the things lent cannot be enjoyed unless they are consumed, destroyed, or alienated. Thus, if a person borrows such things as bread, coals, wine, oil, or other things of a similar nature, he cannot enjoy their use without consuming or destroying them, and they are lent and borrowed with the knowledge and the consent of both parties for the purpose of being consumed and destroyed. Hence, from the very nature of the case, the borrower must acquire the right of property in such things, and what he undertakes to do is to return not the identical things borrowed, but an equivalent amount of other things of the same nature, an equal quality and quantity to the things lent. So when a person borrows money, he cannot enjoy its use unless he is able to exchange it away for something else. Hence, the person who borrows money must, from the necessity of the case, acquire the property in it. And what he undertakes to do is not to restore the identical money lent, but an equivalent amount of money 
at the stipulated time. So if a person borrows a postage stamp, he can make no use of it without affixing it to a letter and so destroying it. Hence, he must acquire the property in it. And what he undertakes to do is not to restore the identical stamp lent, but another of equal value. In all cases, therefore, of the loan of such things as bread, wine, oil, meat, coals, etc., and also of money, postage, stamps, etc., the lender cedes the property in the thing lent to the borrower, and he acquires the right to demand, and the borrower incurs the personal duty to render an equivalent amount of the things lent, but not the identical things. In all such cases, a new property is created, a contract or an obligation is created between the lender and the borrower, and they stand in the relation of creditor and debtor. All such transactions are sales or exchanges and are therefore economic ph phenomena and enter into the science of economics. A loan of this nature is termed in Roman law, a mutum, and in Greek law, some Greek word. To contract a loan of this nature is mutare. The Roman lawyer said that mutum is derived from quad de mio sum fit, because from being my property, it becomes yours. Modern scholars, however, repudiate this etymology, however plausible it may be. The Romans, it is well known, knew very little of their own language. Modern scholars say that mutum is connected to muter, to exchange, as deciduous with decidio and dividus with divido. But though the etymology may be fanciful, as are so many others given by Roman writers, it exactly expresses the fact. In the loan of the mutum, there is always an exchange of properties. In all cases of mutum, or a Greek word, the relation of creditor and debtor is created between the parties, and the right which the creditor has to demand back and the right which the creditor has to demand back an equivalent amount of the thing lent is the credit. Or, as Ortolan says, the price of the thing lent. The reader must therefore observe that every loan of money, whatever, is a mutum, or is a sale or an exchange. Theophilus on the mutum. Number four. This distinction is so important that we may cite a passage from the paraphrase of the Institutes of Justinian by Theophilus, one of the professors of law, who were entrusted with the compilation of the Institutes, because it is more full and distinct than the passage in the Institutes. A real obligation is contracted by an act or by the manual delivery of something counted out, and this includes the mutum. A thing is a mutum where the property in it passes to the person who receives it, but he is bound to restore to us not the identical thing delivered, but another of the same quality and quantity. I said so that the receiver becomes the proprietor of it, that it might exclude the comodatum and the depositum, for in these latter the receiver acquires no property but he must be bound to us to exclude the donation. For he who receives one acquires the property and is not bound to us. I said, he must restore not the identical things lent, but others of similar quality and quantity that I might not deprive him of the use of the mutum. For a person takes a mutum that he may use the things for his own purposes and return others instead of them. For if he were obliged to give back the same things, it would be useless to borrow them. But all things are not taken as mutua, but only those things which consist in weight, number, and measure. In weight, as gold, silver, lead, iron, wax, pitch, tin, and measure, such as oil, wine, and corn, in number, such as money, and in short, whatever we deliver with this intent. In number, weight, or measure. 
so as to bind the receiver to return to us, not the same things, but others of the same nature and quantity, whence also it is called mutum, because it is transferred by me to you with the intent that it should become your property. Quod de mio tum feet. But the real obligation includes como datum, as if anyone were to ask me to lend him a book and I lent it. But the como datum differs widely from the mutum, for the mutum transfers the property, but the como datum does not transfer it. And therefore the borrower, como datarius, is bound to restore the very thing lent. So it is said in the digest, but it is called giving a mutum. Because from being my property, it becomes yours. Qua de mio. Tum feet. And therefore, it does not become your property. If it does not become your property, no obligation is created. But on the contrary, with respect to the comodatum, digest number 13, 6, colon, 8, comma, 9, we retain the property and the possession of the thing lent. Re comodate. No one by lending a thing gives the property in it to him who borrows it. Thus, the whole misconception has arisen from the English words lent, lend, loan, and borrow being used to denote two operations of essentially distinct natures. The French language is equally faulty. The words lower, emprunter, and emprunt are equally applied to both kinds of loan. But the distinction is clearly pointed out both in Roman and Greek law, and the Latin and Greek languages have distinct words for each operation. All commercial loans are motua and not comodata. Every loan of money is, in reality, a sale or an exchange in which a new property is created, which is called a credit or a debt. And when the loan is repaid, it is another exchange by which the new property is extinguished. No one who had the simplest knowledge of the elementary principles of Roman and Greek law or of mercantile law would ever have committed the mistake of confounding the distinction between the loan of money and the loan of an ordinary chattel, such as a horse or a book or a watch. Suppose, for example, one person lends to another for one year at 5% interest. What is the nature of the transaction? Every jurist has pointed out that it is in reality a sale or an exchange in which the lender cedes the property in the money to the borrower and acquires in exchange for it the right or property to demand 105 pounds at the end of the year. And this right is the credit or the debt. And the money is the price of the debt. And the debt is the price of the money. Hence, these things can only be the subject of a mutum, which consists in poder numero, numero e mensura, or which may be estimated generically in weight, number, and measure. Such things in Roman law are termed quantitatis, because equal quantities of bread, wine, oil, coals, etc., are as good as another equal quantity of the same things of the same quality, or of one sum of 100 sovereigns is equal to another sum of 100 sovereigns, or one postage stamp is always equal to another of the same denomination. But also the digest says, mutua vice funguntar. One quantity serves the same purpose as another quantity. From this expression, medieval jurists termed them res fungibilis, and in modern English law, they are termed fungibles. In English law, the former kind of loan, or the comodatum, is said to be returnable in specie, because the identical things lent are returned. The latter kind of loan is said to be returnable in genere, because only things of the same nature are returned. Hence, therefore, though in all cases of a loan, the same person always restores the thing to the lender. Yet the two kinds of loan are of essentially distinct natures. It is much to be regretted that the English language has not two separate words to denote these distinct kinds of loan, like the Latin and the Greek, 
because the double meaning of lend, loan, and borrow has been the cause of great misconception among uninformed writers as to the nature of credit and banking. On the distinction between a debt and a bailment, 61. There is still one more very common and very important misconception to be cleared away to complete the subject. There are three classes of paper documents which circulate in commerce and have some superficial resemblance. That is, they are both transferable by endorsement. Many writers seeing the superficial resemblance consider them all to be of the same nature and include them under the title of credit. This, however, is a profound error. These three classes of documents, though, they have one point in common, namely that of being transferable by endorsement, are yet fundamentally distinct in their nature and effects. These three species of paper documents are, number one, banknotes, checks, bills of exchange, exchange bills, navy bill, dividend warrants, etc., and all other securities for money. All these are instruments of credit, and in law are termed valuable securities. They are all jura in personam and are negotiable instruments. Number two, bills of lading, dock warrants, and all other titles to specific goods. They are termed in law documents of title. They are all jura in re and are assignable instruments. Number three, drafts or orders for the payment of money. In order to understand clearly the fundamental distinction between these three classes of documents, we shall explain how each of them arises. When a person ships goods on board a vessel, he receives from the captain a paper document acknowledging the receipt of the goods and promising to deliver them to a certain person, the consignee, or to anyone to whom the consignee may have transferred the document by endorsement. This document is termed a bill of lading. The shipper of the goods sends the bill of lading to the consignee who directly he receives it may transfer and assign it to anyone else by endorsement. And so it may be sold, transferred, and assigned by endorsement any number of times like a bill of exchange. And anyone to whom the instrument is endorsed may go to the captain and demand the goods from him like a payee of a bill of exchange. And the captain is bound to deliver the goods to the last endorsee. Similarly, when goods are deposited in a dock warehouse, the dock master gives a paper document or receipt for them and a similar nature of, uh, uh, or receipt for them of a similar nature to a bill of lading, which document is termed a dock warrant. This may, so, this may be sold or transferred any number of times by endorsement, like a bill of lading or a bill of exchange, and whoever buys the dock warrant becomes the owner of the goods described in it and is entitled to demand and receive them from the dock master. And there are other paper documents of a similar nature. All such goods in these cases are termed a bailment. The captain or the dock master is merely the bailee or the trustee of the goods, and he acquires no property in them. He merely receives the right of possession of them for a certain time and for a certain specific purpose. He has no right to convert them to his own use or to deal with them in any way except the one for which they were bailed to him. If he did so, it would be a robbery and he would be punishable as a thief. In such cases, no new property is created. The property in the goods remains in the shipper or depositor and is transferred by him along with the bill of lading or the dock warrant. From this, it follows that bills of lading and dock warrants are titles to specific goods and to no others. They form no property with the goods and cannot be separated from them. Whoever acquires the property in the bill of lading or the dock warrant acquires the property in the specific goods described in them. Thus, these paper documents may be said to represent goods and they travel along with the goods. In every case where a bill of lading or a dock warrant is offered for sale or pledge, there must be some specific goods to which it is the title. If there were, were not, it would be a fraud, an indictable offense. Every person therefore who buys or takes such an instrument in pledge knows that he has acquired a title to, specific, to certain specific goods. Buying the document 
is only a convenient way of buying or receiving in pledge the goods themselves. In this case, therefore, there is no exchange and therefore no act of commerce or economic phenomenon. These documents have no value in themselves, i.e. they cannot be bought and sold separately and independently of the goods themselves. No one ever spoke of the value of a bill of lading or a dock warrant. Such documents are not credit because the owner does not simply believe that he can get goods in exchange for them. But he knows that he has acquired the property in certain specific goods. These paper documents are therefore nothing in themselves. They are no addition to the general mass of exchangeable quantities. They are no part of the circulating medium or currency, and they do not affect prices in any way. In a similar way, when a person mortgages his land or house, he actually sells the land or house to the mortgagee. The mortgage deed is the deed of sale and is the title to the specific land or house and cannot be separated from them. Hence, all these documents, bills of lading, dock warrants, pawnbrokers, tickets, bills of sale, mortgage deeds, etc., belong to the class of jura in re and are real rights or corporal property. But bills of exchange, banknotes, and all securities for money arise out of transactions of a totally distinct nature. They all arise out of the sale or exchange of the mutum. Paper credit always arises out of a sale and never out of a bailment. The goods or money given in exchange for the credit become the actual property of the buyer, and the seller has nothing but a right of action against the buyer. It is the absolute fundamental requisite of all forms of paper credit that they shall be absolutely severed from any specific money. They are even forbidden to be made payable out of a, any specific fund. They must be nothing but pure abstract rights against the person, and that is the circumstance from which they derive their name of credit. Because they are only bought on the faith, confidence, and belief that the debtor can redeem them when due. Hence, they are independent exchangeable economic quantities. They are a mass of exchangeable property, just like any other. They do not represent money, but they are exchangeable for money. They are all part of the circulating medium or currency and they all affect prices and produce all the effects of an equal amount of money. Bills of lading and dock warrants circulate in commerce equally with banknotes and bills of exchange, but they circulate in a perfectly different way. Bills of lading and dock warrants always travel along with the goods they represent. And if they are transferred any number of times, it shows that the same goods have been transferred that number of times. But banknotes and bills of exchange are exchanged against goods like money. And if they are transferred any number of times, they circulate an equal amount of goods to themselves at each transfer. Moreover, the law affecting the transfer of these documents is different. All rights to demand money follow the law of money, i.e., when they once but when they once been passed away to an innocent purchaser in commerce, he has acquired a good title to them. And the original owner has lost his jus vindicandi. But bills of lading and dock warrants being in fact identical with the goods follow the law of goods. If they have been stolen and sold or pledged, the owner retains his jus vindicandi and the person who has bought them or taken them and pledged however honestly must render them up to the true owner. Hence, it will be seen that it is a vital economical error to confound the distinction between banknotes, bills of exchange, and bills of lading or dock warrants. The third class of paper documents termed drafts or orders for the payment of money also arise out of a bailment and hold an intermediate position between bills of exchange or banknotes and bills of lading or dock warrants. Public institutions, including the state, corporations, and public bodies of various sorts appoint persons called treasurers to hold their money in trust for them. When they give an order for payment on their treasurer, the instrument is termed a draft or order for the payment of money. The treasurer is, of course, not a debtor bound personally to pay the draft out of his own means, but merely a trustee of the money he holds on behalf of his employers and only liable to pay the draft insofar as he sees sufficient funds to meet it. 
The draft, therefore, is not a charge against the person of the treasurer, but a charge against the fund he holds. The bills of lading and dock warrants are rights in two specific goods. Bills or notes are rights against the person of the debtor. Drafts are rights to an undefined portion of the fund which is held by the treasurer as trustee for his employers and involve no personal liability. Moreover, as the fund under the charge of the treasurer is withdrawn from circulation, the drafts drawn upon it can never be in circulation as well as the money they relate to. Hence, such drafts do not increase the circulating medium, and they can never exceed in quantity the fund they refer to. The economic distinction between these three classes is important. Bills of lading, dock warrants, and drafts can never exceed in quantity the goods they represent or the funds to which they are a claim. But a merchant can issue bills or notes far exceeding the money he may possess at any given time because he is only bound to have a sum of money to meet them on a particular day, even if he does pay them in money. But as a matter of fact, in modern commerce, bills and notes are very rarely indeed paid in money, but by other methods, which will be described in a succeeding chapter. The practical consequence of which is that the bills and notes in circulation enormously exceed the amount of money they are supposed to represent. List of words which in classical Latin and Greek mean material things, but which in juridical Latin and Greek and in mercantile law mean abstract rights and duties. 62. We have shown that among savage peoples and in archaic jurisprudence, wealth is supposed to consist exclusively of material possessions, and that there is very little idea of abstract right. But in the progress of civilization and jurisprudence, the idea of abstract right comes to predominate over material possessions. At first, material possessions only are exchanged and acquire value. But in the progress of civilization, labor acquires value. Services of several kinds are wanted, demanded, and paid for. And words, which at first only meant material things, which, which at first only meant material things, are extended to include labor and services. In the further progress of civilization and commerce, dealings on credit take place, and creditors begin to perceive that they can sell their rights against their debtors and soon began to insist upon their right to do so. Abstract rights, therefore, came to be saleable commodities like material chattels. Moreover, other abstract rights of various kinds came into existence and also became saleable commodities and are as freely sold as material chattels. Hence the meaning of many words which originally denoted material things and had to be extended so as to include labor and services and still further extended so as to include abstract rights of all kinds. At length, in the progress of jurisprudence, many words which originally denoted nothing but material things completely lose their original meaning and are used exclusively to mean abstract rights and duties without reference to any material commodity. Thus, the most advanced jurists have shown that jurisprudence deals exclusively with rights and has no reference to material things. So we have shown that economics treats exclusively of the exchanges of rights without any reference to material things, and that in modern times, the most colossal branches of commerce consist entirely in the exchanges of abstract rights, which have no relation to any material things. It will be very useful to the reader to have a list of those words which originally meant material things, but which in modern jurisprudence and in mercantile law denote exclusively abstract rights and duties, which relate to the present subject, as it is the want of this knowledge which has led to so much misconception and confusion in economics. Property, as we have shown, comprehends the property in material things, the property in labor and services, and the property in abstract rights. And the whole science of economics or commerce consists of the exchanges of these three kinds of property. The words to which we have alluded are, number one, mancipium. In early Latin, mancipium meant material possessions, which could be grasped by the hand. In process of time, 
Mancipium came to mean absolute ownership. Afterwards, dominium was used to mean absolute ownership exclusively and never meant material things. Later still, proprietus was also used to mean absolute ownership as synonymous with domixium and was never used to mean material things. Number two, pecunia. Originally, originally pecunia meant material money only. But in Roman jurisprudence, pecunia is expressly declared to comprehend not only money itself, but every other species of property which can be valued in money and includes abstract rights. Similarly, insert Greek word, in Greek originally meant material wealth, but Aristotle defines it to mean anything, whatever whose value can be measured in money. Thus, it is extended to include labor or services. And in Greek jurisprudence, it is expressly declared to include abstract rights. Number three, bona. Originally, bona meant material goods and chattels. But in Roman jurisprudence, bona means all property, including abstract rights. So, insert Greek word, in Greek jurisprudence, includes abstract rights. So also, insert Greek word, in Greek jurisprudence, means goods and chattels. And demosthenes includes personal credit under, insert Greek word. Number four, res. Originally, res meant material things. But in Roman jurisprudence, res means anything, whatever, to which a person has a right and comprehends material things, labor, services, and personal character, and also abstract rights. Material things are termed res corporalis, Abstract rights are termed res incorporalis. Number five, mercs. Originally, mercs meant material goods, which are bought and sold. But in Roman jurisprudence, mercs means anything, whatever, which can be bought and sold and includes abstract rights. Number six. It is sometimes supposed that oix, oikos means a house only. But in the whole range of Greek literature, from Homer to Ammonius, oikos means all a person's property or possessions of every description and includes abstract rights. In Attic law, oikos is the technical term, including a person's whole subsidence or estate. Number seven, creditum. In classical Latin, creditum means the material things which are lent, whether money or anything else. And the word is also used in this sense in the pandex. In Roman jurisprudence, property which is lent to a person so that it becomes his property, such as money, oil, wine, bread, etc., is termed a mutum. But in Roman jurisprudence, creditum is also used to mean the creditor's right of action against his debtor and is thus synony synonymous with nomen. In modern law, commerce and economics, Credit means the mercantile character which a person enjoys so that he can purchase goods, etc., without paying actual money for them. And by giving his promise to pay money at a future time, and this credit is included under the term wealth. A credit is the right of action which one person has against another to compel him to pay or do something. Number eight, debitum. In classical Latin, debitum means the material thing do. In Roman jurisprudence, debitum is used as synonymous with obligatio, which is the nexus, contract, or bond of law between two persons, by which the one has the right to demand and the other has the duty to pay or do something. But it is also used to, sim to mean simply the debtor's duty to pay. In medieval Latin, debitum is used to mean the creditor's right of action and thus is synonymous with nomen. In modern English law and common usage, the word debt is used quite indiscriminately to mean the creditor's right of action and the debtor's duty to pay. Thus, in modern law and common usage, the words credit and debt are used quite indiscriminately to mean the creditor's right of action. And the word debt is used quite indiscriminately to mean the creditor's right of action and the debtor's duty to pay. So, Expios in Greek means originally the thing do. But demosthenes 
<clears throat> and the basilica, it is used to mean the creditor's right of action. It also means the duty to pay. Nine, depositum. In classical Latin and Roman jurisprudence, depositum means anything, whatever, which is placed in a person's care and custody for the sole purpose of safekeeping, and of which he is a mere bailee or trustee, and in which he acquires no property, and of which he can make no use. But in the technical language of modern banking, a deposit is a banking credit. It is the right of action which a banker creates against himself to buy money and bills of exchange and other securities. It is not a banker's asset, but a banker's liability and is synonymous with an issue. Summary of definitions, 63. The reader will find it useful to have the results of the preceding investigation condensed in a summary. Number one, economics is the science of exchanges or of commerce in its widest extent and in all its forms and varieties. It is sometimes called the science of wealth or the theory of value. Economics may also be defined to be the science which treats of the laws which govern the relations of exchangeable quantities. Number two, wealth. Wealth is anything, whatever, which can be bought and sold or exchanged or whose value can be measured in money or ha which has purchasing power. Number three, a quantity is anything which can be measured. An economic quantity is anything whatever whose value can be measured in money. Number four, wealth, economic, or exchangeable quantities are of three distinct forms. A, material things. B, personal qualities, both in the form of labor and credit. C, abstract rights. These three orders of quantities can be exchanged in six different ways. These six distinct kinds of exchange constitute commerce in its widest extent and in all its forms and varieties. They constitute the science of pure or analytical economics. Five, property is not a thing, but a right. It includes all the rights which can be exercised over anything. It means absolute ownership, hence wealth exchangeable or economic quantities consist exclusively of exchangeable rights. Six, Jurisprudence is the science of rights. Seven, economics is the science which treats of the exchanges of rights. Economic quantities are of three species. A, property, or rights to things which have already come into possession. B, property, or rights to labor or services. C, property, or rights to things which will only come into possession at some future time. Rights to things which have already come into possession are inverse and opposite to, to rights of things which will only come into possession at a future time. Hence, if rights to things which have already come into possession are termed positive economic quantities, rights to things <coughs> which will only come into possession at some future time may be termed negative economic quantities. Rights to material things are termed material or corporal property. Rights to labor or services are termed immaterial property. Rights to abstract rights are termed incorporal property. Rights to labor or services are termed immaterial property. Rights to abstract rights are termed incorporal property. Number eight, every sum of money is equivalent to a quantity of material things or to a quantity of labor or services or to the sum of the present values of an infinite series of future payments. Number nine, rights are divided into rights to specific things termed jura in re and rights against persons termed jura in personam. Number 10, value. The value of any economic quantity in any other economic quantity for which it can be exchanged. 11, money is anything, whatever which a debtor can compel his creditor to accept in payment of a debt. It is also called legal tender. 12, money is a right or title to obtain some equivalent for a product or service. 13, credit is a right of action against a person to compel him to pay or do something. 
14. The function of credit is to bring into commerce the present values of future profits. 15. Barter is the exchange of material products. 16. Sale or circulation is an exchange in which one or both of the quantities exchanged is money or credit. 17. Exchange is where quantities of a like nature are exchanged, either commodities for commodities or money or credit for money or credit. Eighteen, the circulating medium is the medium in which sales or circulation are affected. It comprehends money and credit in all its forms, written and unwritten. Nineteen, currency. Currency in law is the attribute which affects some things by which the property in them passes by delivery. In strict law, it includes money and all written securities for money. As a technical term in economics, it is synonymous with circulating medium and includes money and credit in all its forms, written and unwritten. 20. The channel of circulation means all the money and credit existing at any time. 21. Price is the quantity of money or credit which is given to purchase anything. 22. Interest is the profit on a loan or money when paid at the expiry of a loan at the expiry of the loan. 23, discount. Discount is the profit on a loan of money when paid at the time of advance. 24, rate of interest or discount is the profit made by interest or discount in some given time. 25, production is placing any economic quantity in the market and offering it for sale. 26, a product is any economic quantity which is offered for sale. There are three different classes of producers. A, agricultural producers. B, manufacturing producers. C, commercial producers. Commerce or circulation is one form of production. 28, payment. Payment means anything, whatever, which is taken in exchange for anything else. 29, satisfaction. Satisfaction is anything, whatever, which is accepted as the final close of a transaction. 30, Capital is an economic quantity which is used so as to produce a profit. Any economic quantity may be used as capital. 31. Capital may increase in two ways. A, by increase of quantity, and B, by commerce or exchange. Capital is said to be fixed when it remains in the possession of the capitalist and he only derives a revenue from its use. Capital is said to be floating when the capitalist parts with it entirely in one operation and the value of it is restored to him in the price of the product. 33. There are three ambiguities in the theory of credit or debt. First ambiguity, A. A debt is not the money owed by the debtor, but the abstract personal, pro but the abstract personal duty of the debtor to pay the money. B. Second ambiguity. The word debt means both the creditor's right of action and the debtor's duty to pay. C, third ambiguity. The words loan, lend, and borrow have two distinct meanings and denote two distinct operations in, in, which, in one of which credit is created and in the other it is not, which are distinguished in Latin as mutum and comodatum. 34, a loan of money is a sale or an exchange in which the property in the money passes to the borrower, and in exchange for it, he gives a right of action to demand a sum of money at a future time, which is the price of the money. 35, a bailment. A bailment is where anything is delivered to the care of a person for a definite purpose, as a trustee, and he acquires no property in it. 36, bank notes and bills of exchange always arise out of sales, either of money or goods. They are not titles to any specific money. They are rights of action against a person. They are jura in personam and are termed valuable securities. Bills of lading and dock warrants always arise out of a bailment. They are always titles to specific goods. They are jura in re and are termed documents of title.